Good morning, everybody. It's time for another morning Bible study. I'm your host, Logan McCulley, and today we're getting into 1 John 3. Let's do it. Now, I'm going to start with the first verse. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. We should be called children of God. That's exclamation point. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Boom, boom, boom. There's some things that just happened there. The breakdown. What manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. That's the breakdown. This outburst of wonder introduces the third feature of the believer's hope. The believer's hope is strengthened by the fact that God's love initiated his salvation. Christ's Christ's return will unite the believer with the heavenly Father who loves his child with an immeasurable love. God, John expresses utter astonishment at God's love for the believers and making them his children. Therefore, the world does not know us. The real aliens in the world are not extraterrestrials, but Christians. Having been born again, given a new nature of heavenly origin, Christians display a nature and lifestyle like their Savior and Heavenly Father, a nature totally foreign to the unsaved No wonder scripture describes Christians as pilgrims or sojourners and strangers. The Lord Jesus was unearthly in origin, and so are those born again. Our true transformed lives have not yet been manifested. Wow. That's all I can say about that. Now, I do want to pause for a second because I kind of jumped into this because I'm doing a lot of stuff here behind the scenes. I'm recording on a new microphone, and I'm doing this, so if I'm a little out of it today, just bear with me. Verse 2, okay? Verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Hmm, interesting. All right, so the breakdown. Now we are children of God. Everyone who exercises genuine saving faith becomes a child of God at the moment of belief. Though the true heavenly divine life in that person will not be revealed until Jesus appears. In the meantime, the Holy Spirit is working into us the image of Christ. We shall be like him. This phrase introduces the fourth feature of the believer's hope. When Christ returns, he shall conform every believer to his image, his nature, i.e. his nature. A tension exists between the first part of the verse, now we are children, and the latter part, we shall be like him. Such tension finds resolution in the solid hope that that at Christ's return, the believer shall experience ultimate conformity to his likeness. The glorious nature of that conformity defies description But as much as glorified humanity can be like incarnate deity, believers will be without becoming deity. All right, there's also something interesting about that. Okay, so let's read that again. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be. We don't know what we're going to be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Hmm. There's so much about that. There's so much about that. And I don't really know where to dig in, to be honest with you. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Hmm. I wonder, I wonder if it's talking about when Jesus comes back, like, you know, when he comes back for us. We don't know what we will be, but we know we will be like him. We don't know for sure. Interesting. Verse 3, And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Capital he is pure. So, because we have this hope in him, Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. So we purify ourselves because we have this hope in Jesus, just as Jesus is pure. Hmm. Purifies himself just as he is pure. This is the key verse 
to the verses from 228 to 33 and introduces the fifth feature of the believer's hope in this section. Living in the reality of Christ's return makes a difference in a Christian's behavior since Christians someday will be like him. A desire should grow within the Christian to become like him now. That was Paul's passion expressed in Philippians 3:12 through 14. That calls for a purifying of sin in which we play a part. It calls for a purifying of sin in which we play a part. Everyone who has, I'm going to read the verse again. Everyone who has the hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. We should be constantly purifying ourselves. How do you do that? You confess to God. Jesus takes that sin from us. Verse 4. Let's get into that. All right, so verse 4 into 24, there's a section change, okay? It's going to be, it's going to be a tone change. I'm going to read that, the breakdown of the tone change. The primary aim of this section is to combat false teachers who are corrupting the fundamentals of the faith. These verses further amplify, reiterate, and emphasize the moral tests already presented by John. Verses 4 through 10 convey that genuine believers practice righteousness, while verses 11 through 24 relate that genuine believers practice love toward fellow believers. John was very concerned that Christians know how to tell the true from the false, the genuine from the artificial, true believers from false ones. He presents tests here and throughout this letter to help determine the validity of anybody's claim to be a Christian. Oh, he's he's examining some fruit. And that's so the reason why I decided to go into first John is because my wife wanted to really get in was getting into first John at a Bible study at church, and she was like it's so awesome because it gives you a roadmap of expectations and how and like legitimately you can make sure that you're a Christian. There's there's tests of validity. Like you can make sure the test is valid to make sure you know who, what, when, and where. And that's what we're reiterate, reiterating here. So the section of three four, these verses deal with the Christian's incompatibility with sin. The false teachers that John combated because of their agnostic-like concepts. So these verses deal with the Christians' incompatibility with sin. The false teachers that John combated because of their agnostic-like concepts. We talked about that at the beginning. They were trying to slit the hairs on what they said Jesus was. They were there and they saw Jesus, but they're like, oh, well, you know, maybe he wasn't a man. He was a spirit. And because he was a spirit, uh, the spirit came down and got into this person that we knew was Jesus. And then the, the spirit, we can say he was he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is wrong, what I'm saying right now. I'm just letting y'all know that. But those people were saying he was the spirit that filled this man that we knew as Jesus. And then when he was crucified, the spirit left. And then what we saw come back was the spirit, which there's so many holes in that as far as like, well, then spirits don't eat. Spirits can't be felt. Spirits can't be touched. Uh, or I guess spirits can't be touched. They can be felt, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but they were just splitting the hairs. And the reason they were splitting those hairs was because if that was true, well, then we can't sin with our physical body because it was all spiritual. So if I have a spiritual knowledge and my spirit is clean and you can't do anything physical, well, then we can do whatever we want on the physical realm and still go to heaven. That was the hair they were trying to split, and John's trying to say, hey, yo, no, 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 no. Like, that is not what this is. Don't be led astray by half-truths. Don't let people split those hairs, and you fall in trap with that. All right, so let's read verse 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Let's stop there. Whoever commits sin commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. The commit sin, the verb commits, the Greek is conveys the idea of making a sin habitual practice. Although genuine Christians have a sin disposition and do not commit a need to con what? And do not commit a need to confess sin, that is not the unbroken pattern of their lives. A genuinely born-again believer has a built-in check or guard against habitual sinning due to a new nature born of God. Right, let's read that again. 
The Greek conveys the idea of making sin a habitual practice. So let's read that again. Whoever commits sin habitually also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. So whoever commits sin habitually. Although genuine Christians have a sin disposition and do not commit and do not commit and need to confess sin? Pauls. And do commit and need to confess sin. Okay, we're saying, all right, so genuine Christians have a sin disposition and commit sins and need to confess sin. That is not the unbroken pattern of their lives, though. So we're not we're saying that is not the actual pattern of lives to com- to continually commit a sin, continually uh, come back and specific sin, right? So that's what I think we're talking about. We're talking about continually commit the same sin over and over again and never try to be better with Jesus, with God. Because that is, because a genuinely born again believer has a built in check or guard against habitual sinning due to a new nature born of God. It's not saying you're not going to sin again. It's saying a Christian does not habitually commit that sin. Mm. All right, three, five. I think that's important. I think that's important because you need to know. What are the, what's the expectation, right? Like you have to be aware of what our expectation is for us. It's like, yes, you're going to commit sins, but the habitual sin is where you need to like catch yourself and you're going to have that catch from God. So like, listen to it. Don't, don't turn your nose up to rebuke. All right. Verse five. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him, there is no sin. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him, in Jesus, there is no sin. All right. Uh, He was manifested to take away our sins. A second reason why Christians cannot practice sin is because it is incompatible with the work of Christ. Christ died to sanctify, to make holy, the believer. To sin is contrary to Christ's work of breaking breaking the dominion of sin in the believer's life. This is true. He was okay. This is true. I'm gonna read it again. And you do know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Hmm. Verse six. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Okay, let's get into that. Does not sin. Like the phrase commit sin of verse four, the sense conveyed here is the idea of habitual constant sinning. So if you know Jesus. If you know Jesus, you will not habitually sin. If you know him, you will not habitually sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him. Whoever habitually sins has neither seen him nor known him. Okay. Grace, grace, grace. Got to have some grace. Uh, The breakdown. If no check against habitual sin exists in someone who professes to be a Christian... John's pronouncement is absolutely clear. Salvation never took place. And he's specifically calling out those people who were cutting that hair of being able, they were saying that they were being able to sin all they wanted in their physical body because it was separate spiritually and they were splitting hairs to be able to do that. John is saying, no, you cannot habitually sin. You have to have repentance. Like that's kind of a part of this. Don't get caught up in that. Then we go into verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. Just as he, capital he, is righteous. The breakdown. The let no one deceive you. The word deceive means to be led astray. Since false teachers were attempting to pervert the fundamentals of the faith, The possibility existed that some Christians might be fooled into accepting what they were advocating. To prevent this deception from occurring, John repeatedly emphasized the basics of Christianity. Examples being the need for obedience, the need for love, and the need for a proper view of Christ. And then when it says, practices righteousness, I'm going to read it again. Let little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The genuine believer's habitual lifestyle of righteousness stands in sharp contrast 
to those false teachers who practiced sin. Since Christ died on the cross to transform sinners, those truly born again have replaced the habit of sin with the habit of righteous living. Just as he is righteous, is the next breakdown, those who are truly born again reflect the divine nature of the Son. They behave like him, manifesting the power of his life in them. You know the verse Jesus was talking about, uh, not the verse, but like when Jesus was talking to maybe his disciples about you make sure you count the cost before you, you know, an army engages in battle or you build a tower. This is one of those things where it's like, make sure you know the cost of what it means to follow Jesus. Like, to me, that's what I'm hearing. I'm saying, I'm going, oh man, like those times that I get angry or those times that I get short, or like, especially when I'm hungry, like last night there was a scout thing and I was hungry. I was tired. I was, I was like, I was getting aggravated and you get called out. You're like, well, G would Jesus be aggravated right now? Like he was hungry at times. Like he went through these things. Peace and patience, peace and patience. Sometimes that's where I struggle, man. Like, especially when I get hungry, dude. I tell you what, like I lose, I lose a lot of points real quick when it's like, I'm hungry and I'm tired and it's getting late and I'm like, y'all need to hurry the heck up. Like, so I read that and I'm like, man, like, practice the righteousness. Practice the righteousness, Logan. Pray for the righteousness, honestly. That's the, that's the thing that also I struggle with. I think we all struggle with is it's not me that can do it. It's praying for, praying for God and praying for Jesus and the Holy Spirit to work in me. And what do they want? That's the thing. Like I'm, I'm doing, we're doing this prayer thing at church, just talking about prayer. And it's like, you can pray for the face of God or the hand of God. What is the hand of God? The hand of God is his, what do you call that? Like what he gives out, his help, his mercy, maybe not mercy, but his, his, his provisions. The face of God is praying to know God better, to have him revealed to you, like how to get to know God better. And you should be praying for the face of God as well as the hand of God, right? And I prayed yesterday for what you want from me. Like, God, what do you want me to be? Like, God, how can I be better? What are the things that you see in me I need to work on? Yeah, that's that's kind of what I've been focusing on. And getting short with people when I get hungry is obviously one of them. Verse 8, He who sins of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Let's pause, let's reread that. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. All right, he who sins. This phrase, again, who means habitually practice sins of the devil. The phrase gives the, the source of the false teacher's actions. The term devil means accuser or slanderer. Not only does Satan oppose God and his plan, but he is the originator of the instigator of sin and rebellion against God and his law. Therefore, all unsaved are under the diabolic influence of Satan. Their sinful lifestyles reflects their satanic origin. John contrasts the children of God with the children of Satan in terms of their actions, while those who are truly born again reflect the habit of righteousness. Satan's children practice sin. All right, let's pause for a second. So I've been thinking a lot about spiritual warfare because... I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a new Christian. And like, I always, always heard people growing up talking about spiritual warfare, spiritual warfare. And I was like, really? Like, I don't feel under attack. Well, it's because I wasn't a Christian. You I mean, you're not going to be under attack if you're not doing something for God, right? Uh, you'll be pushed further and further, but it's like, it's a difference. It's a difference. So like, when you find Jesus, there's going to be things that tempt you. That's the thing, the temptation. And like, I just noticed how there's so many things that try to tempt you, whether it be people or uh, like the Facebook or uh, I don't know, just pe people in general. People in general are really like how the devil works, right? Or put you in certain situations where you're going to be tempted to do something that you're not supposed to do. Uh, and it's, 
And when I say not supposed to do, it's like, it's like a protection thing. It's like you're not supposed to be, get bit by that snake. No, we should know that, but then we have to be reminded of that because Satan is that snake, legitimately, literally. So I've been thinking a lot about that, how spiritual warfare is very real and it's very accurate. Like our church, I feel like, is on the edge of a revival or uh, something big happening. It, you just feel the energy in there. And in and, and, and our small groups and our choir and everything. And this last Sunday, I don't know why, but our pastor gave a sermon over like over Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, I'm a new Christian, didn't know who it was. It was confusing. Other people had different questions. Other people had, um, even longtime Christians were kind of, kind of, like, what? What are we doing? And it was like descent in the ranks. There was like blood in the water. And I'm like, oh, wouldn't it? My wife made this point, actually. Wouldn't it be just about right for the devil to try to confuse and sow descent in the ranks when we're on the edge of doing something so great? Spiritual warfare is very real. And, it, I mean, and it's not our pastor's fault either because he's a man as well. I mean, he like it, it doesn't take anything away from him. It's just kind of one of those things that you see and you go, it's pretty real. It's real. But it's hard. The, the science guy in me goes, it's hard to quantify. It's hard to quantify unless you experience it. And even then, it's hard to qualify. All right, from the beginning is the next thing we're breaking down. From the beginning, and this comes from, from the uh, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. Since Satan was originally created as perfect and only later rebelled against God, John probably means the moment of his rebellion against God, the beginning of his rebellious career. Since sin characterizes him completely, so everyone characterizes by sin must derive from him. Oh, because the devil is because sin categorizes the devil so well because it's like Logan is like you have to use a bunch of qualifiers like a, a man white uh, Christian dad stepdad paramedic nerd like you have to do a lot but like sin is the devil and therefore whoever sins is of the devil because sin is the devil not every nurse is a Logan but everyone who sins is the devil uh, for this purpose that he might destroy. So this is talking about Jesus. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. A third reason why Christians cannot practice sin is because Christ came to destroy the works of the arch sinner. Satan, the devil, is still operating, but he has been defeated, and in Christ we escape his tyranny. The day will come when all of Satan's activity will cease in the universe and he will be sent to hell forever. Ooh, interesting. Works of the devil. This summarizes a variety of the devil's activities. Sin, rebellion, temptation, ruling the world, persecution, and accusation of saints. Instigation of false teachers, power of death. Uh, that's it. Summarizes the variety of the devil's activities. That, that, those are the devil's activities. Temptation. Heard that one. Accusation of saints. Heard that one. Pray for the church. Pray for our church, specifically. That's all I'm going to say. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his seed remains in him and cannot sin. Because he has been born of God. Breakdown. The fourth reason why Christians cannot practice sin is because it is incompatible with the ministry of the Holy Spirit, uh, who has imparted a new nature to the believer, born of God. John wrote here in the new birth, when people become Christians, God makes them new creatures with new natures. Believers have God's characteristics because they have been born into God's family. This new nature exhibits the habitual character of righteousness produced by the Holy Spirit. John repeats this phrase twice for emphasis, his seed. The seed remains in him, he cannot sin because he is born of God. The new birth involves the acquisition of a new, of a seed, which refers to the principle of life of God imparted to the believer at salvation's new birth. 
John uses this image of a planted seed to picture the divine element involved in being born again. I like that. You get the seed of God in you at salvation. Hmm. Then you grow the, tr grow, grow the tree with faith, and then where's the fruit? The word, or it remains, is the last one we're going to break down in that verse. The word conveys the idea of the permanence of a new birth which cannot be reversed. For those who are truly born again are permanently transformed into a new creation. And then he cannot sin. Sorry, that's the last one. This phrase once again conveys the idea of habitual sinning. When we're born again, God's seed remains no matter what. Because he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Promises of God. I love some good promises of God. Verse 310. This In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Sorry, that was 10 and 11. Pause. Okay. 10. This summary verse is the key to verses 4 through 10. Only two kinds of children exist in the world, children of God and the children of Satan. No one can belong to both families simultaneously. Either one belongs to God's family and exhibits his righteous character, or the other belongs to Satan's family and exhibits his sinful nature. I like that. Okay, so either you're in God's family or you're in devil's family. Uh, 10b, who, he who does not love his brother... So the verse is, uh, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. This phrase introduces the readers to the second aspect of the moral test, the test of love. John develops this thought through verses 11 and 24. The false teacher not only had an erroneous view of Christ's nature and displayed disobedience to God's commands, but they also displayed a distinct lack of love for true believers who rejected their heretical teaching. Oh, interesting. So I guess that would be like a thing you know if you were there. You could see that if you if your other believers were denying the heretical teachings, well then those heretical teachers were like, oh, those people suck. Like, we, we hate them. I don't like using that word, but maybe that's what they said. That's kind of a test of like, oh, well... Like, I feel like even now, like, when you've got people, and I get more sad than I get angry that people that deny Christ and just refuse to follow him, because that's our goal, right? We have to give it to them, up, give them enough information to either accept or deny. If they can't, if they haven't made that choice, well, then we haven't done our job. They either need to deny it or accept it. You can't make them, but you need to get, make them have enough information to make that decision on their own. I don't know where I was going with that. Let's, there's a tone change, though, in 311 to 24. I'm going to read that tone change. John elaborates on the, love, on the love life of genuine believers. The love life. For those who are truly born again, love is indispensable characteristic. The new nature of seed that God imparts not only exhibits holiness, but also love as a habitual characteristic. Those who practice love give proof of the new birth. Those who do not have never been who do not have never been born again. That's kind of weird. Those who don't have that never have been born again. All right. <clears throat> if you don't have that love, you've never been born again. Verse 11. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Verse 12. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Hmm. All right, let's break down 11 from the beginning. Since the beginning of the gospel proclamation, love has been a central theme of Christianity. John emphasizes what they heard from the beginning to emphasize that the false teachers were preventing that which God through the apostles proclaimed. We should love one another. Another, well, not another, another. This phrase highlights the habit of love displayed by those possessing the new nature Love is not merely an optional duty for someone claiming to be Christian, but proof positive that one truly has been born again. Hmm, interesting. Uh, again, another tone change in 12 to 24. Hmm. 
As noted throughout this epistle, John often repeated the same truths, expanding on them to allow his readers to hear them in new and fresh ways. Each time he presents the same truth in a new package, which expands on a particular aspect of their significance or approach. The subject from a slightly different angle. Verses 12 through 17 addresses the characteristic lack of love displayed by the children of the devil, while in verse 18 through 24, he talks about the characteristic love displayed by the children of God. Verse 312 is where we talked about Cain. Not as Cain, who was the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. Come on, Cain. Come on, Cain. Uh, Cain. Scripture presents Cain outwardly as a God worshiper who even offered sacrifice. Cain's murderous actions, however, revealed that inwardly he was a child of the devil. And then breaking down who was the wicked one and murdered his brother. John presents the first of three behaviors of the devil's children manifesting their lack of love. Murder, the ultimate expression of hate. His works were evil. Cain's offerings were not acceptable because he was sinful. Jealousy was behind his hate and murder, as in the case of the religious leaders who had Christ executed. Oh. Jealousy. You murdered Christ. That's great. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? I mean, Cain, Cain did it to Abel. Cain did it to his own brother. Those, those religious leaders of the Sanhedrin murder Jesus out of jealousy of what they didn't understand. That's, that's dangerous waters. And Cain's offerings were not acceptable because he was sinful when he offered them. That also calls me out like, hey man, make sure you're, you're given, you know, happily, happily give a tenth of everything. What we have is not ours. It was, you know, allowed us to be had by God. Let's not forget that. Keep it straight, Logan. Uh, we're going to do 13 all the way through 15, and then we're going to stop for today, okay? Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know, oh, okay, that's it. That's verse 13. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. That might be our Bible verse for today. The background. History is filled with stories of the persecution of the saints by the world. This does not surprise believers because hateful Satan is their father. Doesn't surprise me. 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. I don't want to do that. So we know we've passed from death to life because we love. Becoming a Christian is a resurrection from death to life and a turning of hate to love. A lack of love indicates that one is spiritually dead. Love is the sure test of whether someone has experienced the new birth or is still in the darkness of spiritual death. Uh, someone who is in death, someone who's characterized by hate, has never experienced the new birth. Next breakdown. Abides in death. Someone who is characterized by hate has never experienced the new birth. I mean, that's a good test of like how you know your Christian brothers. It's a good thing to know as well because sometimes I have a hard time like knowing if you're a real Christian. Like if you know Jesus, because like there's a lot of people that just don't know. Because you know, like Jesus says that the oh gosh. This is oh man, what is the verse? It's like the way to heaven's be harder for. It's the narrow way. It's the it's harder for a camel to go to the eye of a needle. It's hard. It's hard. Like there's a lot of people that don't know that they don't know Jesus. Like when you get to heaven, they'll be like, I don't know you. Like there's a lot of people I feel like are cultural Christians that don't know Jesus. Like you can know the knowledge, and I don't know the knowledge. I'm working on it but don't have the, the, the heart knowledge. And sometimes, here's my point, sometimes I'll go to things like a, like a conference and I'll be like, I don't know about this guy. And then it'll be like at the end of the conference, I'm like, oh, that guy like really you know knows Jesus. And sometimes I feel like I need to open up a little bit quicker so that I can get my head in it a little bit better instead of being so skeptical on the front end. Point of growth for me. This is a good way to know a little bit quicker whoever, who those real Christians are. Verse 15, 
Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know him. Know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Read that again. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. This is true. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. John presents the second of a third of three characteristics of the devil's children with respect to their lack of love. Hatred is spiritually the same as murder in the eyes of God. The attitude is equal to the act hate. Oh, no, no, no. The attitude is equal to the act. Hate is the seed that leads to murder as seen in the example of hatred of Cain for Abel that resulted in murder. Oh, man, hatred is spiritually the same as murder in the eyes of God. So, oh gosh, if you hate somebody, do you hate? That's why I don't, I dislike the word hate because hate is as strong as murder. Let's read that again. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. It says it in the Bible right there, clear as day. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in binding him. So, Oh, man, because there's people that I, I strongly dislike. Like, you know you know the phrase, like, I wouldn't pee on them if they were on fire. Oh, man, that's something i got to work on. That's something i got to work on. Mm, all right, pause. That is where we're going to end today. That is 1 John 1 through 115. Or, sorry, ugh, 1 John 1, 3 all the way through 15 verse 15. So that's it for us today. Pray for me on that, like that, that, that hate thing. Cause I, I wouldn't say I hate people, but like strong dislike is, is, is a okay word to use. And sometimes I feel like I'm there. So pray for me guys and pray for the church. I feel like something's big happening and I don't want there to be dissent sowed in the ranks. So pray for my church, Faith Baptist and Bartlett and Pray for me and Jennifer because we got a baby on the way, guys. We have a baby on the way. So we want everything to be healthy, to be grown well, to be well formed, all the pieces and parts where they need to be. It's going to be awesome. Next time, we're going to finish up 1 John 3 and we'll get right into it. Guys, this has been the Morning Bible Study with your host, Logan McCulley. I'm out.